Our families of our people are uh, under the impression we're still meeting at nine. I don't know how that's possible at this point. Uh, but I did butcher the announcements week after week after week. Um, so that may be playing into it. It might be partly my fault. But um, nevertheless, we're, uh, today is the first day of our summer season officially. And uh, so we're changing our time to 8 o'clock. And we do that, of course, for the sake of the uh, lifeguards and the beach people that come on and about 9.30, we want to be off the beach by that point. Uh, but for the sake of consistency, of course, we're going to meet here this morning at 8. And uh, we'll do that all the way through maybe uh, September. And then I'll, I'll give you an exact date when we'll change that. But I think it's going to be uh, October. This is the first year we're, we're, we're kind of adjusting a little bit, uh, just trying to accommodate as much as possible uh, people coming along. Being able to take advantage of the fact that lifeguards aren't on. When the lifeguards aren't on, there's no need to be there that early. So that's what our, our motivation is for that. Um, for those of you who are unaware, we just are finishing up uh, the Jericho March this week. Um, that was six nights of walking around the city in, in uh, congregational prayer. And... Uh, we finished that up last night. It was quite interesting uh, to see the weather uh, cooperate or didn't cooperate last night, but it was just a downpour and sideways wind up until the point that we uh, uh, came to the beach and, and went out for the walk. And then it, the wind was still quite strong, but the, uh, the rain stopped and we were able to do our walk. Uh, for the most part without any real problems and finish that up. And I just really appreciate everybody that uh, participated in that this week. Uh, I know some people were not able to, and uh, so uh, we understand that, but we're thankful for those that were able to. And uh, some people were able to just come once or twice, some people were able to come every night, and uh, it was a great encouragement. But it's something that we... Uh, We've done every year for 20 years. We don't necessarily uh, we don't necessarily uh, uh, I forgot I dropped, lost my train of thought. Let me start again. It's something we've been doing now for about 16 years, and uh, we don't just do it as a matter of rote or a matter of um, just uh, a tradition. We do it out of a sense of of, of, of essentiality, that it's important for us to go into the season well prayed up. You know, the, by, uh, there's never been a revival that's ever happened without a season of, of concerted prayer. And uh, so that's really our, our prayer is that there would be a revival, first of all, in the hearts of, of God's people, and secondly, that in, in, the, in the community as we uh, take the gospel to the beach, to the public arena. And uh, we don't go out there, especially in the culture that we have today, without uh, knowing that God has gone before us. And so we, we went into this week with a season of prayer, six nights. We kind of loosely based it on, on what happened with the Jericho March. And then, of course, on the seventh day, they walked seven times around the city. Um, we aren't going to do that this morning. Thankfully, we're not going to have to walk seven times around the city. But we are going to give up a shout, and we are going to symbolically uh, claim that God's going to give us the victory, as we've been praying for all week. And and I believe that God has given us the victory. Uh, you know, we we also prayed for good weather this week, and obviously we're not having good weather this morning. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, this is going to pray hopefully every week this summer. Uh, but we do, our, our main prayer was that God would begin a revival and uh, begin a real movement of the spirit uh, in the community. And so we really believe that that's going to happen. And uh, we're looking forward to going through that. But as we sing together this morning, just bear that in mind, that together we're collectively giving up a shout of praise to the Lord. And uh, symbolically, uh, the, we believe the walls are coming down uh, that are going to, allow us to be able to present the gospel in freedom and the truth uh, this summer to great effect. 
So uh, that's the uh, that's what we've been doing all week. And uh, last week, of course, we didn't have our Bible study uh, during the midweek because of that. This week, we will be having our Bible study again. Uh, we're we're going to be beginning a new book, a study in the book of Esther. Pretty a relatively short study compared to some of the ones we've done in the past, but we'll continue each week with uh, Wednesday night Bible study at 7, seven o'clock. We're calling them bonfire Bible studies uh, now. We used to have spaghetti dinner and do all that, and with the COVID thing, we kind of dropped the dinner. So now we just have a, a bonfire outside, and we'll have that regardless of, of inclement weather. We've got some tents we can set up back there if necessary, and we could even go inside if necessary, but we're, we're going to plan on being outside uh, and having a bonfire for the Bible study every Wednesday night starting uh, this Wednesday as we go through the summer, and we would encourage you to participate in that as you have the opportunity. All right, that's all the announcements. I feel like we've got to get everybody up on their feet and go in this morning and get rid of the grogginess and get rid of... Uh, after effect of getting up at 8 o'clock in the morning this morning, being at church at 8. But let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. We'll start off with that, and then we'll uh, get going. It's so nice to have David with us, David Armstrong. There you are, David. David, why don't you open us in prayer this morning, if you don't mind. Uh, no, I'm going to have that afterwards, just uh, just opening prayer, if you don't mind. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this morning, and even though the weather is not gave us some Bibles back there. I think there's only two left, but they're uh, special edition Bibles for, for people in the military. Um, I think the Marine Corps is what it's listed at. Nevertheless, they're on the back table. If you have someone in the military you'd like to share that with uh, this Memorial Day uh, or any for any reason whatsoever, those are free back there to take. So there's two, I think, left. I'd love to see them get in the hands of somebody there that uh, would appreciate them. All right, we're going to sing this morning a song that's probably uh, apropos considering the weather this morning. All creatures of our God and sick King. All creatures of our God. This is our shout to the Lord on the seventh day. So let's lift up our voices. The Bible says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. <clears throat> Don't have to sing well, just have to sing loud. Thou burning sun. 
church and uh, <clears throat> the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and um, Memorial Day of course and a famous verse that we hear a lot about you know those who have you know, served and fallen and died and even those that are still uh, you know with us but maybe suffering from PTSD or those who have lost loved ones to, you know, suicide in the military or whatever. I have a good friend who I went to school with and he uh, you know, lost a leg in Vietnam, but he serves over in Baltimore. He sings and uh, I got to watch him on YouTube yesterday a little bit, but he helps a lot of soldiers that are returning from you know the young you know the young folks of course he's not here anymore either but uh, so I'd like to remember them in this verse of John 15 13 the greater love is no one than this is that one lay down his life for his friends so just a moment of silence because we all probably have someone here that we know or would like to. Psalm 19. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. And day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them, he has placed a tent for the sun, which is that, which is, <coughs> which, as he is the bridegroom coming out of the chamber, it rejoices as a strong man to run his course. It is rising, it is from one end of the heavens in its circuit to the other end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. And the, and the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. And the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. And the commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. And the judgments of the Lord are true, they are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yes, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. <coughs> Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for the ability, the, the, the opportunity, the freedom that we have here today. 
because of those that have you know, fallen, served the forest, but Lord, most of all, that you laid your life down for us, the supreme sacrifice. We just thank you, God, that uh, we can look to that every day as our motivation, our inspiration, our joy, <clears throat> and our freedom. And Lord, just help us to, to uh, there's nothing we can do to repay that, Lord, other than to give you our hearts and to surrender to you each day. And uh, Lord, it, <clears throat> I just would ask that the message that Roy has for us this morning would be a reflection of your, of your spirit, with what you would like to say to us, what you would like to, for us to obey, for what, <clears throat> whatever re repentance we need to offer to you. Um, <clears throat> we just thank you for each person here today. I just pray for inspiration today through the message. May we, and we, may we go forth from here today, Lord, inspired um, and more motivated to serve you throughout this week. We ask all of it in Jesus' name. Well, we're actually going to be teaching today from the book of 1 John, chapter 2, and uh, we're just looking at four, uh, four verses today, verse 7 through 11. Let me read them for you, 1 John, chapter 2, and verse 7, and of course, we preach through the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, so we're here today on these particular verses as a continuation of our study. But also we believe by the providence of God. This is what he would have for us today. So verse 7. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes this morning that we might see truth that you have presented in your word. I pray that you would open the eyes of our heart, that we might understand the word, that we receive it as the good seed which falls on good ground, and that springing up it might bring forth life, I pray in Jesus' name. Well, for what John has been teaching up to this point a simple review is that a life of sin and new life in Christ are incompatible. He says in chapter 1 that you cannot walk in darkness. That means you cannot walk in sin. You cannot live in sin and say that you have fellowship with God. He also makes it clear in the next verse that fellowship with one another is predicated on being right with God. Now that that is the positive perspective that he gives, that being right with God is being in fellowship with God and with one another. From a negative perspective, Paul, I mean, John says that sin breaks fellowship with God and with one another. And sin is defined by the commandments. You cannot determine sin apart from the commandments of God. Now, God did plan in the man, in, in the heart of man, or in the mind of man, a conscience, which is supposed to make us feel guilty for sin. It's supposed to help guide us and make us conscious of sin, but we can't actually rely on our conscience to do that because it's possible for the conscience to become so callous by sin 
that it no longer does or operates the way it should. 1 Timothy 4 verse 1 says, But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars, here it is, seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. So false teaching, or what John calls demonic doctrine, or Paul calls demonic doctrines, and the lies of the enemy can cause the conscience to stop working so that a person no longer feels any remorse or, or even perhaps not even the consciousness of sin. The conscience is not a reliable way to determine sin or to know sin. The most reliable way we come to know sin is through the word of God through these commandments. Now Paul agrees with that principle. He said, I would not have come to know sin except through the commandment. Romans 7, 7, what should we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the other contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So the law is not sin, Paul's saying, but the law is good. And the law defines sin as sin. Listen, it's very important to recognize sin as sin. I don't think you can be saved. Me and my wife were talking about this yesterday morning. She gets preached at every time we take a walk around the community. And so does everybody in the community. And the community is growing constantly. They're building houses like 10 a day around our neighborhood. And as these houses become occupied, they're hearing the word of God preached at about 5 o'clock every morning, I think, as I yell at my wife. Uh, but nevertheless, we were talking about this, that I don't believe the Bible teaches that you can be saved unless you recognize that you're a sinner. I think that's why John deals, first of all, in this epistle with the issue of sin. Paul does the same thing. It's not just John. Paul does the same thing. In, in the chapter, first chapters of Romans, defining sin. You know, the lie of Satan is to debunk the law and thereby attempt to nullify sin. The lie of false teachers and false prophets abound in the church today in America is in effect say that there is no sin or to legitimize sin. Or say that what the Bible calls sin is not really sin at all. So starting in chapter 2, verse 3, John shows that fellowship with God is contingent on not living in sin. And that sin is defined by the commandments. Verse 3, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. As we said last week, or for completed is maybe a better translation of that. In other words, the love of God is received by us, which sets off a chain reaction in us, a spiritual chain reaction that completes the transformation that God initiated in us, which is that we end up loving like he loves us. So, to use the metaphysical language of John in verse 6, we walk as Christ walked. We walk in the light as he is in the light. We become like Christ. We love like Christ loves. That's the purpose of our salvation, to become conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Now, I, I warned you last time, at the end of my message, that it's possible to misinterpret the message of John and, and get the idea that you have to keep the commandments and try to be a better person in hope that you earn the right to fellowship with God or somehow you, you, you can get into fellowship with God. But if you do that, then you miss the essential point of salvation. The essential point of salvation is that if we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that happens by faith in what Jesus did, did on the cross as our propitiation, as the satisfaction for the judgment of God towards sin. Now that cleansing, that forgiveness of sins, produces in us a righteousness from God, not on the basis of what we have done, but on the basis of what Christ has done. But it also produces in us a transformation, a change of heart, a change of our nature, a change from life, from death to life. This new heart is the key to keeping the commandment. It's not just, you know, before we're saved, mustering up enough willpower to overcome our natural tendencies and, and, and become by a self of, a, an act of self-will and discipline a better person, a nicer person. That's not salvation. Rather, God changes the heart. He gives us a new spirit and puts his spirit within us. And the result is that we are now a new creation. We have a new nature, new desires, new attitudes, informed by the Spirit of God, so that we might be empowered to do His will. And so as a regenerated child of God, we are able to keep His commandments because we want to please Him. Our desires have changed. So the product of our regeneration is sanctification. We learn to act like children of God. We learn to become children of God. God spoke of this supernatural change of the heart, which would come about through salvation. He spoke of it previously in the Old Testament. The first reference to it is found in Jeremiah 31, 31, which says, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They, shall not, I, they will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all will know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Notice that in this new covenant, God not only forgives their sin, but he writes his laws upon their heart. He puts his laws within them. That speaks of a heart change. From a heart of stone to a heart that is in tune with God. A heart that loves God. And consequently a heart that obeys God. There are three other references to this that are found in Ezekiel to this heart transformation resulting in keeping the commandments. The first is found in Ezekiel eleven nineteen, 19, which says, And I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. And I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. Then they will be my people, and I shall be their God. Then further down in verse 27, he says, God, God says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So not only is the regenerated man given a new heart by which he has a love for God and a desire now to keep the commandments of God, but he is also, very importantly, given the Holy Spirit, who gives us the power to keep the commandments. We get a new heart and a new spirit, plus the Holy Spirit, to indwell in us. That's the difference between the Old and the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, they were given the law, and the only incentive they were given for, giving the law, for, 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 for obeying the law was that you would die if you didn't keep the law. You would be punished. There was a penalty. In the new covenant, we are given the law, 
But Jesus paid our penalty. And we are given a new heart. And a new spirit. And the Holy Spirit. All to enable us. To keep. His word. The last reference. Of this transformation. In Ezekiel. Is Ezekiel 36. 26. Which basically says the same thing. As the previous references. He says. He says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and will cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. This is the new covenant he's talking about, folks. Not the old covenant. This is the new covenant. In which the result of this transformation of a new heart is new desires and a desire to obey God and and, and, and keeping his commandments. Now that's such a tremendously important doctrine that God repeats it no less than three times in the Old Testament. And it's important to comprehend this doctrine because that truth is the foundation for understanding what John is teaching here in this passage in 1 John 2. As we understand that doctrine, we can now read verses 7 and 8 with discernment. Listen to verse 7 and 8 again. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness has passed it away and the true light is already shining. Without the insight given us through the Spirit as we consider the promises of God there that we just looked at in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, we might be scratching our heads as we try to comprehend the idea of the old commandment and the new commandment. What is he talking about? And perhaps because of that, many commentators have tried to find some sort of distinction being made here between the old covenant and the new covenant. They say perhaps that under the old covenant, we're given 613 laws or so, depending on how you count them, but but under the new covenant, we're only given two. Love God and love your neighbor. So they seek to explain it as if in the new covenant, there are only two commandments, and these are easier to keep, and everything else is just legalism that has now been eliminated by grace. But that, of course, is the wrong exegesis. What John is actually saying here is that the difference between the old commandment and the new commandment is simply that there's a new way of keeping them. In the old commandment, there was the law given and the penalty given for not keeping it. In the new covenant, we are given the means by which to keep the commandment. Under the old covenant, the only incentive was to avoid punishment. In the new covenant, the incentive is love. Which comes from a regenerated heart and a new spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to help us. In the old covenant, you were legally bound to keep the law, but you didn't have the resources to keep it. You didn't have the ability or the power to keep it. In the new covenant, you have all the resource you need, all the power you need, which is the power of the Holy Spirit in you. I think that's where the modern church misses the boat on the purpose of the Holy Spirit. They think the Holy Spirit is given to give us some sort of feeling, some sort of confirmation of the fact that we're saved. Some may be an ecstatic experience which validates that we know God. But in fact, The Holy Spirit is given to give us the power to keep the commandments of God. To be our helper that we might do the deeds of God. Now notice also, John says in verse 8 that he's writing a new commandment to you which is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the new light is already shining. Now what is he saying there? I submit that when he speaks of that which is true in him and in you, he's speaking of the word of God. 
Another analogy which we looked at earlier in Ezekiel talked of sprinkling clean water on you. And I think that's a, another reference to the word of God. We see that also played out in, in, or spoken of in Ephesians 5.25 which says Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. And what happens as a result of that? The washing of the word, he says, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her, I'm sorry, so that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. The washing of the water of the word produces a holy and blameless life. Sanctification, holiness, is keeping the commandments which comes as a result of the washing of the water of his word. So we're able to keep the commandment because we have the cleansing power of the word of God at work in our hearts, in our lives. Which John says means that the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. You know, the word of God is compared to truth. It is, is compared to light, which makes the darkness which is sin and ignorance flee. Peter speaks of that in 2 Peter 1.19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, he says, which you do well to heed to as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. The word of God is light. It drives out the darkness. Peter goes on to say in the subsequent verses in 2 Peter one. Uh, that this, all scripture is given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So we see there how the word of God is used by the Holy Spirit to work in us, which produces good works in us, which are that we keep his commandments. So the evidence that you know God, the evidence that you have fellowship with God, the evidence that you have the Spirit of God, John says, is that you keep the commandments. John's made that very clear. It's not some feeling that you have or some experience that you had or some claim that you're on intimate terms with God and he just talks directly to you and that's how you know. No, the evidence that you know God is that you walk according to his word, that you keep his commandments. Now last week we concluded that all the commandments we're able to be summarized in what Jesus said were two. Yes, he was responding to a lawyer that asked him this question. What were the greatest commandments? And Jesus told him that the foremost commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And he said the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he said upon these two laws hang all the law and the prophets. So not just the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, that's the law, but all the prophets, that's all the rest of the Old Testament. The entire Bible that had been written at that point encompassed in those two commandments. Paul speaks of this law of love in Romans 13, 10, saying love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So in both the Old and the New Testaments, love is the summary, the fulfillment of God's law. So keeping the commandments, especially the law of love, which is the summary of the commandments, is a test by which we may prove or show that we love God, that we know God. John gives us two tests here, both a negative test and a positive test by which we may know that we know God. He states the negative first in verse 9. He says, the one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. John goes back to this metaphor. He back and uses this metaphor of light and darkness again to illustrate our relationship with God. It's almost a restatement of, of chapter 1, verse 6 which says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So 
Simply put, to hate your brother is darkness, it's sin. To hate is sin. Back in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus equates anger towards a brother with the sin of murder. In Matthew 5, 21, it says, You have heard the ancients were told, You shall not commit a murder, but whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, You good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, You fool, shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell. Now, anger... Or vehemence, I can't say that word for some reason. I, I, I rehearsed it a dozen times this morning to try to make the right pronunciation of vehemence. Is that how you say it, Carol? Of course. Okay, if Carol said that's the way I do it, and I'm right. Well, vehemence doesn't sound right to me. Or anger towards a brother may be the manifestation of hate, what we think of as hate. When we think of hate, we tend to think of a violent, vehement anger towards someone. But hate is actually broader than that. Hate may include disdain or contempt. It may not manifest itself outwardly at all. You may hate someone and never be known as hating. It may just be an attitude of contempt for someone. As if they're beneath you, that they're not worthy of your attention. That also may be considered hate. But I would suggest that hate in the use of this verse is even broader and, and seemingly more innocuous than that. I would suggest that hate in this context is the opposite of love. Hate is the opposite of love. We can see that in the next verse as John contrasts love with hate. He's, he's contrasting the man who hates versus the man who loves. So hate is whatever love is not. If that's the case then, it's necessary to define love if we're going to define hate. In verse 10, we have the introduction. This is the only time John uses the word love. He uses it here in verse 10, but he's obviously talking about it. He says, the one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. The word love is from the Greek word agape. It's a very familiar word for, for most Christians, I'm sure. But nevertheless, let me give you a synopsis of the word as a refresher so that we might better be able to define what love is not, what is actually hate. So agape is a, defined, is a divine love, the kind of love which God had for the world, which was manifested by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So this love is a self-sacrificing love for another that puts their good above your own. The verse Joe just quoted there, he didn't know I was speaking on this today, but greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. It's a self-sacrificing love. That's the love that Christ had for the church, and that's the love that we're told we're to have. In the King James Version, you sometimes see it translated as charity. Charity is, it gives us the idea, the understanding that, that love isn't something which we feel or that we receive, but it's something that we do for someone else. But a better definition of love is given in 1 Corinthians 13, chapter 4. I often quote this on in, in, uh, in wedding ceremonies and so forth, but you, you're familiar with it. But think through it with me again. He says, love is patient. Love is kind. And is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffer. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now that sets love at a pretty high standard, doesn't it? It's the law of love. Jesus said in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Jesus loved us with an unconditional, sacrificial love. And we are to love one another like that. We are to love our brother like that. 
We're to love our neighbor. We're to love our enemy. <clears throat> so based on that definition of love, hate then is what love is not. Hate is not caring about the better good of your brother, but only caring about your own good. Seeking your own interest and not seeking your brother's best interest is hate. Hate is being unforgiving towards another. Hate is being provoked towards another. Hate does not act or acts unbecomingly towards another. Hate is being jealous of another. Hate is arrogance toward another. Hate rejoices in unrighteousness. Another way of saying that is hate condones unrighteousness. So John says, the person who says he is in the light, you know, and I feel like a lot of times as, as, fan, as Christians, we tend to condone or at least kind of want to ignore or wink at sin in a friend's life or a loved one's life or whatever for the sake of not offending them. And we think we, we, we love that person and, and we, you know, we care about that person. We don't want to hurt their feelings, so we're not going to say anything to them. We're not going to rebuke them. The Bible actually teaches us here is that if we, that love, love uh, rejoices in the truth. It doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. It doesn't condone it. And so you can't really say that you love your, your, your loved one, whoever it may be, and yet not speak the truth. You speak the truth in love, but love requires that you tell them the truth. Not that you condone their sin and try to just wink at it or excuse it. With the excuse that you love them. No, if you love them, you're going to tell them the truth. You're not going to condone their sin. So John says the person who says he is in the light, that says he is a Christian, that he is in fellowship with God, and yet if he acts in any of those ways which are opposite of the way love operates, then actually he is in darkness. He is in sin. Love is righteousness. But hate is sin. Such a person who hates is in sin. And sin has no fellowship with God, even as darkness and light cannot coexist at the same time. John continues on that theme in verse 11, saying, But the one who hates his brothers in the darkness and walks in darkness does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Sin has blinded his eyes so he don't know where he's going. I think that's a reference to what we spoke of earlier about the conscience being dulled or calloused, being seared by continuing in sin. Notice, notice John speaks here not only of being in darkness, but of walking in darkness. That's a continuing lifestyle in sin. To continue in sin is to harden your heart. Sin builds up a callousness in your heart that keeps you from feeling remorse or guilt. And so in their sin, their heart becomes hardened, calloused, and they continue on the way of darkness, believing a lot and not knowing that where they're going is the path of destruction. But in contrast to the person who hates, John presents the person who loves in verse 10. He said, the one who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. To abide means to continue to dwell in the light. That, that's what fellowship with God is, is really all about, to abide in the light, to be in the light, to dwell in the light, is to walk in the light. And we do this by walking in the Word. Psalm 119 says, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. To walk according to the Word is to walk in the Spirit, is to walk in the light. That's how we stay close to the Lord. And because we're in fellowship with God, we love our brother. We love because he first loved us. Abiding in light produces a love towards one another. Love is the manifestation of our faith. It's the product of our love toward God. Jesus said, if you love me, then you will keep my commandments. Abiding in the light and loving one another 
John says, gives no cause for stumbling in us. What that means is our light is not a stumbling block to someone else. Because love is giving preferential treatment to the other. Love is, is, is doing what's best for the person. Someone else not doing what's best for yourself. It's not holding a grudge. It's not being jealous. All those things that, that, love, that, that Paul said love is, is back in 1 Corinthians 13. Those are things that end up becoming a stumbling block to another person. A stumbling block causes a person to fall into sin. Being a stumbling block to others is a result of hate. It's the result of selfishness, not love. But when we love the way Christ loved us, then the stumbling block is removed and the other person is edified, the other person is built up. So if we abide in the light, You know, Christian maturity is that, folks. Christian maturity, Christian sanctification is the same thing. It, it's really that. It, it's where you stop living for yourself and you start living, loving someone else, loving the church, loving one another, and, and, and sacrificing what, what your primary interest for another's primary interest. That's why we evangelize. That's why we, we go out to the world and, and try to lead people to the Lord. It's because we love them. And we love them, we're willing to, to do what's best for them. We can't say we love people, we can't say we love our neighbor, if we're not willing to give them the truth of the gospel. If we don't share with them the gospel. In fact, John says here that the lack of that desire on our part, the lack of that care, Concern on our part for others is actually hate. So if we abide in the light, we love one another, we do not put a stumbling block in front of them by our behavior, but we actually encourage and strengthify and edify one another. That's the fulfillment of the law. And that is the evidence that we are in fellowship with God. I pray that you are walking in the light as he is in the light. That you are walking by the Spirit and that you have the power of the Spirit within you, and that you are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ as you obey him and keep his commandment to love one another, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Well, that's all that I have for you today, a reminder to stay in the word of God, to stay close to the Lord, to obey the Lord. If you love God, you'll keep his commandment. But most importantly, to go back to that whole scenario I, I told you about in, in Ezekiel and Jeremiah, to recognize that this is not something you can do by your own strength or by your own power. You just can't become a nicer person through your own strength and through your power. You need a transformation. And God has promised in salvation to forgive you of your sins, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, to put his, a new, give you a new spirit, to give you a new heart and to put his Holy Spirit within you. And then you'll be able to keep his ordinances and then you'll be able to keep his laws and fulfill his will in your life. Only by the power of the Spirit living in you and working in you through this transformed life. A new heart and a new mind. So I would ask you this morning, you know, have you had that change? Have you been transformed? Have you been converted? Have you been changed? It's a drastic change, not on the outside, but on the inside. And it's possible through faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, asking him to be Lord of our life, to change us, to make us new, and create in us a clean heart. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as David prayed, Lord, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me so that we may walk in your statutes and keep your ordinances, so that we might do the things which you have commanded us to do, that we might be truly children of God, that we might be your people, called out, set apart, consecrated, holy. Lord, we can't do it in our own strength, in our own power. We can only do it through the power of Christ, 
that works in us, to change us and make us a new creation. I pray, Lord, that you would do that this morning to anyone that has not yet received Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. I pray that today is the day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's sing. Come ye sinners, poor and needy. This may not be in your songbook, it may be on a paper there by your songbook, or it may be in the cover leaf of your songbook, and I have to look for it.